My name is Sandy Williamson. My co-author is Jeff Tepper from University of Puget Sound. He's been a real asset as we've been working on this for years. Developing a phosphorus treatment plan. I'm going to cover a lot of material because of this format and delivery mechanism. You can pause it when you're watching it. So I'm going to go pretty fast and cover a lot of material. You can slow it down and focus on any parts that you're interested in. Spanaway Lake has a 15 year history of significant uh, algal blooms and excessive aquatic plant growth with much of the year uh, being in an advisory level for algae. The algae numbers are very noisy and affected by climate, but there's a general trend with quite a few numbers above the 2000 closure level, particularly in the fall of 2019, closed for about 10 weeks and three weeks in 2020. Spanaway is a glacial kettle lake, like many dozens or hundreds in the area of Puget Sound. Highly permeable glacial outwash around it, so lots of groundwater flow. It is unusual in that it has surface flow in and surface flow out, but still the predominant source of water in is groundwater. 250 acres, depth of a maximum 29 feet. So two thirds of the water comes from groundwater, one third from Coffee Creek, drainage basin about 17 square miles. So in 2016, Brown and Caldwell $400,000 study uh, from an empirical model predicted that more than half of the phosphorus comes from internal loading and the remainder from groundwater. But data collected since then indicates that the phosphorus level in deep waters through the summer is very low probably because the lake sediments have very high iron, probably coming from Coffee Creek. That's name came from that colloidal iron from uh, wetlands upstream. So here's the basin showing about a third of it is undeveloped forest land on the army base. And the rest of it has uh, 6,000 septic tanks of which we think maybe 1,000 or 1,500 are reaching a lake at this point. So that will continue to get. We're focusing on the Southeast Bay, which happens to be near my house. And we've discovered a handful of vents that look a little like this. This is not an actual picture, but it's a better picture of a, of a nearby vent. And, uh, and then we're going to describe more of the canal that's connected to this four acre bay that we have and are going to do some more testing in. This is what the sand boils look like in the about five foot deep of water surrounded by fine mud in this area that's about 10 square feet of the bottom is sandy. And you see this. So. This shows lake temperatures measured in January, showing a pretty high gradient coming from 41 in the middle of the lake and increasing in the four acre bay, increasing to 49 at the head of that canal. The groundwater is 49 or 50 all year long. So in the winter, the bay and canal is much warmer than the lake. And in the summer, it's much cooler than the lake. So that's where the fish tend to hang out when the fishermen go. Our first step of testing was using these seepage meters, uh, basically a bucket with the bottom cut off hooked to a tube. We had difficulties there as is outlined. Um, so if it's not a sediment is the main source, if it's groundwater, um, we have, will probably have different treatment than we would have. Um, Brown and Caldwell recommended a aeration alum input pump in the deep part of the lake, $2 million, even though there's not a working one in Western Washington, even though we have dozens, if not hundreds of lakes with 
uh, similar problems. So we estimate that we will probably have to do um, treatments more than once during the summer of the water column, or if we could intercept incoming water. Another test we've done is microcosm, slightly bigger with a three foot diameter hula hoop with a foam around it and a clear vinyl curtain down to the bottom with another hula hoop held down with bricks. Um, this sounded like a good plan, but it's too hard to keep it equal to the rest of the lake around it. And the flow through is a little too fast, so we can't do any long-term measurements of the effect of Z. Next set of experiments with were the microcosms. And uh, we had problems as outlined in the bullets here, but we did notice that the ones treated with zero valent iron had much less algae growth than the ones that were untreated. So the next set of experiments we want to do is a bigger scale, more lake-like. We want to use this hand-dug canal that's really a inlet for the lake. It's about 70 feet by 300 feet and averages six or seven feet deep, except it's shallower at the outlet. It's surrounded by high ground that's maybe 20 feet above the lake level on all three sides. So high groundwater flow. And as you've seen in the temperature map before, we have uh, seven or eight inch degrees temperature difference between the canal and the lake, showing large groundwater input as the temperature in the groundwater is about the same all year and it's warmer than the lake in the winter, colder in the summer. Residence time's likely only a few days. Since there's a narrow, shallow outlet, it inhibits uh, circulation of the water from the lake. It makes it easy to sample the outflow. So we want to test all three products, zero veil and iron, a light application of alum without needing a buffer, and FOSLOC to see which does the most effective job of remo removing phosphorus from the water column. So we think the likely treatment solutions, we wanna test these three and see which is gonna be better during the winter. And then we'll take the winter and make an application next summer, we hope. We have voted in a lake management district, which will be much better than the sporadic homeowner efforts we had in the past. And we have um, the lake management district will bring in about $100,000 at $4 a front foot average of maybe $500 per property. Also gives us access to government grants directly and gives the lake management district can authorize whole lake treatments, which we never had the ability to before. FOSA will continue with its flexibility in how it spends its money to um, be timely in, in terms of uh, finding the best solutions. We've gotten a 300,000 grant for two years from the legislature. So that gives us uh, around 200 or 250,000 a year to treat for these next two years. Very helpful to us volunteers has been this new tool from HANA that allows us to analyze sample results down to five parts per billion in as little as five minutes and 50 cents each after we purchased the $60 photometer. And uh, we found that it's not quite as accurate as what's predicted and that we need two or three samples to get a decent estimate of the concentration at one moment. One of the best ways Fossil has gotten donations is by these license plates. They're aluminum. For $300 a year supporter, you get two of them, one to put on your dock and one to put on your house or fence or driveway. Um, we've gotten five to 10,000 a year this way and gives us, and we've also gotten small grants for administrative costs, but this gives us the most flexible strategy to test different solution and fill in gaps in data and studies. We can do within our own resources. So local stakeholder volunteer science is needed because it costs 
10% or less because of no travel, very little logistics, less time, and no contract delays. We can institute a study and start it right away. We did so this summer. It, within six months, we spent under $10,000 and got what would have cost 100000 or more with a contractor and the government being involved and would have taken a year or two. With local volunteer science, the uh, driving force is internally collect, correct and separate from a profit mo motive or a government uh, CYA motive. And volunteers see something all the time so they can fine tune their hypothesis. Government, we found, is too risk averse to be helpful. They don't want to treat. They just want to spend money on research and not do any treatments. And consultants are great, but they obviously need to make overhead costs and they get higher wages than you get with volunteers. So, well, volunteer science has great advantages in cost, flexibility, and speed. Um, you need the right knowledge and skill set or know where to get it. Local universities, uh, maybe government can help asking them to review your science plans. Uh, we need uh, local experts who will volunteer their time. Maybe you need to incentivize this with recognition or whatever else. It's challenging with volunteer organizations to maintain stability, document results. And you need a team of varying skills. What government should do that is often not being done, provide support to volunteer organizations around their related track, science consulting, maybe policy consulting, and really try to break down their own and other levels of government obstacles to progress. They can provide spreadsheet templates for data and other facilitation. They could actually ask, how can we help, which we've never been asked. Realizing that you have no funding for that and telling volunteer organizations that you can't do that, when they recognize that your funding is 10 to 15 times what there is, is, is um, discouraging to them. So here's how to contact us. Thank you very much.